Chair, you are live. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to the May 17th uh, monthly meeting of the Maritime Advisory Board of the City of Annapolis. As is uh, my custom, I'll go around, uh, this being a virtual meeting, I'll go around the screen in the order that I have on my screen. So we have Andy Fegley, who is one of our mem board members, uh, Debbie Goslin, another board member, Alan Miller, another board member, Frida Wildy, another board member. We have Stephen Rice from the city of Annapolis. We have Jake Iverson from Watermark, who was an inv invitee. We have Peter Trogdon, who's a member of the board. We have Beth Bellis, the Harbor Master, Duncan Hood, a member of the board, Mike Tomasini, a member of the board, uh, Julian Jacques from the city of Annapolis virtual TV or what a TV station, Brian Callahan, Brian, welcome, and Kimberly Consoli, who is our uh, reporter. And with that, we will just get started. It's such a beautiful night out there. I suspect people would rather be outside than in a virtual, whoops, what happened to me? I'm still hearing you, seeing you. Well, I somehow went away on the video. I don't know why. Um, We're still seeing you. You look marvelous. Yeah, but I don't see anybody else. So that makes it a little, uh, little difficult. Let me, um, I don't know why that, uh, huh. I don't know where I went. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to sign out and sign back in. Uh, Scott Allen, are you there? No. Um, well, Debbie, Mike's going to share his. Debbie, will you I'll just take over and act as chair and, and uh, <laughs> let's deal, deal with the minutes and I'll log back in? Sure. Okay. Okay. So, uh, has everybody has seen. The minutes from April 2022. All right, I'm back. I don't know how that, what, what I did, but. Uh, I didn't even get one thing checked off, Terry. Go, go, go ahead. Go, go, go. Come on, Is there a motion to approve the minutes? You've got it. Second. Okay. All, all in favor? All right. All right. Back to you, Terry. Thank you. Um, Second item on the agenda, which Debbie did a nice job of sending around the note her notes from the April 25th, 2022 um, uh, minutes of the Merit, uh, Maritime Ad Industry Advisory Board from the um, county. And one thing that caught my eye, Debbie, and maybe you know or don't know, um, there was a reference to a, a Maritime Zoning Code update. Do you remember what the details of that was? It looks like it had to do with the uh, buffer. Yes, I don't, I don't really understand all the details, but apparently in 2008, there was a zoning change and it didn't change the 100 foot buffer, but it created a 25 foot buffer. And I may not be getting the details right, but this is a correction to address the 75 feet in between. Because I guess there was some question that as a marina, you still couldn't, you, you still had to honor the 25 foot buffer, not the 100 foot buffer. So they were correcting it so that uh, to address the 75 feet between 25 and 100. Does that make sense? That, that makes sense if they, uh, if they left the no man's land in there, uh, yeah. no person's land, I guess I should say. And I guess they had they had talked about that when Peter went to the meeting before and the meeting that I attended, um, Tim Martin from Bay Engineering was there to explain it. So I think it was not clear to a lot of people. Um, well, if he was there to explain it, it's because they probably ran into a problem about uh, somebody wanting to expand an arena or build something in, in within 100 feet, but outside of 25 feet or something. Right. All right. Um, thank you. Um, Alan, thank you for the swap. And I think you may just luck out because looking at the minutes that Debbie sent, it, check and see, but it looks like they're going to cancel the June meeting. <laughs> so uh, 
Alan has swapped with me and I took, I took July because I had a conflict in June and now he doesn't have to go at all. The um, next item is any comprehensive plan update, uh, Duncan or Stephen? Duncan's having, no, there's Duncan. Yep, you, any update on the comprehensive plan? I'm afraid not, Terry. I, I, no. Okay. I haven't heard a thing. Stephen, have you heard anything about what's happening with the comprehensive plan? Uh, I have not. Um, I know it seems like I'm shirking my duty, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you're, you weren't tasked with uh, you weren't tasked with doing anything about it. Um, so let me uh, the, the Burtis House Long Dock policy we had had on the agenda in March. We did not revisit it in April. We had some comments that, and Beth, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the, uh, the proposed policy and the, uh, the applications for the charter of that uh, dock went to the rules committee um, in April, uh, maybe early May. And it currently has been posted uh, in the newspaper for comments through May 24th, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, first of all, have you received any additional comments? All the comments I believe that I've received are on the spreadsheet that I shared with you. Okay. So um, I mean, I, I would generally, but I would say um, the overriding concern that I've received from the Office of Law um, sort of as an overview and also from Jay Garberson and also from Woodwind is that, and, and also from other parties, is that they don't want people coming for free and charging for services, which I think, I think that's the most important edit that we have to consider. People don't want nonprofits to come for free and then charge money for sales or deck tours, or maybe anything, I suppose Jake or Demi could speak to that. Um, so that's the most important edit that we've heard over and over and over again from a multitude of sources. So there were two comments because I went back and actually pulled up my notes uh, from, the, um, from the March meeting. The one was the issue that you just mentioned, that is, if you have a vessel that is being offered free dockage, they then should not be allowed to sell tours, sell tours at the dock, take people out for, for hire, um, sell t-shirts, or do anything of a profit-making or commercial nature. Um, and if they, if they do, then they ought to be charged the standard dockage fee. Um, the other note that I had from that time, from that period, had to do with the way it was worded, and I don't know if I don't recall if that got changed or not. But the um, that the you could the, the way it worked is that you could each individual not for profit may make only up to four reservations per year at a rate of not greater greater than one reservation per month for no more than seven consecutive calendar days. Um, that would appear to at least allow one vessel to occupy the dock for 28 days. Is that still um, the, is that still part of the policy? It seems that's, like an extensive, extensive use of the dock by one particular vessel. That's still in the draft, but it has been suggested um, that you may not do like the end of one month and the beginning of another. So you couldn't come on June 21st and stay till, I don't know, I'm not doing the math, but July 4th. So like monopolizing the dog during the most important times of the month. So it was suggested and I, I'm sorry, but I can't remember who suggested that, but I think that idea does have some merit. And I, and I would tell the group that um, given that we've been in this um, draft policy for some time now, um, the captains have said that they agree with the policy, that they will abide by the policy and that they appreciate 
our um, our need to have order, and and they're they're good with it. Like I haven't had a single nonprofit complain. So other than maybe the Wimbledon. So with with that being said, is is there a is there a uh, a, a suggestion afoot as to to change the I'll call it the 28 day policy or the back to back. I mean, there hasn't been a there hasn't been a succinct or specific suggestion to change that. So I guess uh, let's go, just open it up to the discussion here then, since those and see if there are any other issues that members of the board have, and then also whether or not we want to take a position on one or both of the ones that we've been discussed so far. So I'll, and again, just following the order on the screen, Andy, you have any thoughts on this? In general, I think school ships and tall ships are a total bonus and asset to the city. And I'm encouraging them how we can, acknowledging the limitations where they come in conflict in conflict with the people who are running businesses in town. But in general, I see less limitations as a benefit. Uh, Debbie. Thank you. Um, the policy at the charter dock for years, I know it was that way when Ellen was there and I talked to her today just to confirm um, that she remembered it that way too. I, I know it was that way, but that pride used to come in and if she was just here um, and not doing for pay cruises, she would get to stay for free. And if she um, was charging for cruises, then she would pay the standard fee. So, and Baltimore Harbor worked that way also. So I think that there's a precedent for that. And I am not part of Watermark anymore, but I think it's a fair thing to do. And I think that the issue of a boat, a nonprofit boat wanting to come um, for four weeks in a row or at the prime times may be um, mitigated if we are charging for when they charge. In other words, the, the fact that it's not free might make them not stay as long. I, I don't know. I appreciate what and Andy is saying, but it really does create conflict for the uh, the local maritime boats who are here 12 months a year. And I think it's fair. I have a couple of comments on the actual application itself as well. Um, the form calls for name of legally responsible party, but later on it, it's the term owner is used. And I think there just needs to be some coordination there. And maybe it should be owner on the actual application. It probably needs to be legally responsible person in any event. So we probably need to make that match because whoever's signing is the legally responsible person. Um, he'll be held to the terms. So that might be a CEO. I'm yeah. not sure. I, I don't know. I think that's a an Ashley call, but there are two different terms that are used in the application, so they should be the same. And there's one clause that says dockage is not confirmed within a valid credit card on file. And I think that's supposed to be without a valid credit card on file. We fixed that in the latest. Oh, okay. Yeah, but good, good, good catch. Okay. All right, uh, Alan, any thoughts? Kind of agree with Andy that, that, that it's a good thing. Um, while we probably wouldn't use it, um, you know, the ability to bring our junior captains program and some things like that over to the dock and pay for it, I think is, uh, is something I'd like to have access to. I mean, if somebody's parked at the dock for a while, they're not charging, that's fine. Um, but I do think charging kind of brings kind of a, a more realistic assumption with it. Um, Cause there's things that, that, you know, speaking from the school point of view, that we would probably use that every once in a while um, and pay for it. Uh, so I think that's a good route to go, if that makes sense. Uh, Frida. Thank you. The only comment I have is I appreciate Beth's trying to bend over backwards to pacify 
so many different parties. It's got to be a really, really tough thing to do. But thank you for that. And no other, nothing else to say. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Terry. No, I, I would echo with Frida. I think, uh, Beth, uh, it's a challenging situation uh, um, for, for City Doc. And um, I don't have any further comments. Uh, Duncan. Yeah, hey. Um, I think the um, visiting boats, if they're making money, should definitely pay their way. I think, um, sort of echoing off of Debbie's thing, I think believing that charging a daily rate will um, dissuade them from staying for weeks and weeks at a time. I may be a little too loosey goosey. I would like to see something that says, you know, you can stay X number of days every 30 or every whatever. But I, th I think a little more definition there would work out great. And of course, I do want to encourage nonprofits, but at the same time, I want to encourage a, uh, you know, an organized and managed dock system. And I think uh, charging money makes it look like we're, you know, really here, really in business. So, so Beth, as I understand it right now, the, uh, the, policy, the policy would be they can stay up to seven consecutive calendar days, but not, uh, but not overlapping two months, as you said, at the end of the one month, beginning of the other. Uh, and for up to three, up to four times per calendar year. So they uh, one week a month for up to four months. Is that a fair statement as to what it is now? It's mostly correct, but it doesn't provide that they can't overlap. So it's one week, one full seven nights, four times a year, but it doesn't say that they can't do the last week of June and the first week of July. So I did something like, you know, seven days in every, every 30 or something like that. Um, I defer. Um, I'm thinking seven days out of 30. So they would, that, but that would mean they would have to wait 30 days. They'd have to wait 21, 23 days before booking again. Well, no, before landing again. Before landing again. Yeah. I mean, well, that's what I meant by booking again, but yeah, before landing again. Um, Can we say after seven days by express permission only to give us some flexibility if there's somebody we do want to support because it's good for everybody? You can stay seven. If you're going to do it congruent, you have to get permission. I mean, I don't see any problem whatsoever given there's a reasonable gap. I don't care what the gap is. It could be four days, it could be seven days. But if you only get four bites at the apple and you can't make it like consecutive, I think it would be fine, but I'll defer to the group. Uh, uh, question, uh, it, if it was, if there's a waiting list, if there's people waiting to come in, then it would could necessarily kick to a higher level. If nobody's going to be there, better to have a boat there than not a boat there is my feeling. But that's not really going to happen because that, that dock is going to be used by everyone now. So when there's not a tall ship, there's going to be wreck boats and that's filling up fast. So like for Blue Angels and 4th of July, all of those spaces are filling up and maxed out. And uh, I, I don't, I don't foresee a waiting list as being something that would be something that our current staff could handle well. I, I think it would would be better just to have this is the policy, bingo, done, um, and. Um, But if we were to say, if we were to say simply, no more than seven consecutive, well, seven consecutive calendar days. You could say seven consecutive calendar days a month, um, and a minimum of two weeks in between bookings. 
I'm, I'm, I, I, that was one I, way I was thinking about it. But the other I was thinking about it was if it's no more than seven consecutive days, no more than seven. So Beth, does it have to be, if you were to say, um, no more than seven days in a month and no more than seven consecutive days. So somebody could come in and they could, eat, if they took, if they booked the seven, you know, that would, that, yeah. So if they booked seven days in June, the last seven days of June, if they booked the first four, seven days of, if they booked the eighth day in July, they would not be compliant with seven consecutive days. They'd be compliant with seven days in June, but not with seven consecutive days. And that would force them to break it. I mean, to me, that's a bit more stringent than my view, but I will defer to the group. I mean, I don't think they need more than one week in between. And I don't really care if it's in the exact same month. So if I'm June 1st to June 7th or 8th, and then I have a week and then I'm another week in June, I don't really care, um, but I would defer to the group because maybe I don't have the bird's eye that the rest of the team does. Is there is there a, um, I mean, have we had a situation, well, we really haven't had the situation, but even when it was, um, I, I guess Bull and Bear were there, obviously more than seven consecutive days when it was under the state or the, uh, not under the city's management. Um, all right, and Duncan, I thought you had your hand. Uh, Scott, I think I missed you. I uh, digressed. Scott, what? Um, a couple of comments. Of, yeah, of the, sorry about the that. Seven, and Mike, too. On the seven day per 30 days, I think is what people are trying to say, um, which I, I don't disagree with. And I'm not sure saying per month, you know, on a calendar month is, is, is the best way to go, but if seven per 30. But I think you, I think there ought to be a way, Beth, maybe by special permission or something, that they could lump two together, by with permission, not automatically. But they just can't say they're going to lump it together. But you could use up an extra week and put them together, so it's a two-week stay with permission, not normal, but have something by special application or something. Would be my only suggestion um, on that, and I. I'm not sure if you say seven days per calendar month, it may be easier to say seven days per 30 days, you know, something like that. But those are my two comments on that. Um, going back to Andy's, I, I agree with Andy. I think it's good for the city to have as many as possible, as often as possible, whatever. And I also agree with Debbie on her, her viewpoints on that um, along the way um, as well. But then obviously you have to be able to monitor it and share it. Um, so if you have a seven day at a time, you could go 14 days by special permission, Beth, and whether it's your permission, somebody's, whatever. But I, I would say that might come into play sometime with a little bit of flexibility there. So they could use up a, a second of their four seven day stays and put them consecutive for a 14 day stay with special permission, not automatic. Um, for my thing, part, I would not be interested in a special permission I would like to have like an overriding rule uh, because I've my, I'm, I'm super busy. Um, so I would just like to have a rule that everyone abides by. So I, I respect your thoughts, but yeah. I would not like to have special permissions. Yeah. I, I don't know how you administrate it, but it just something like that because some, sometime some boat, not someone, but some boat might um, have a 14 day window and they don't plan to use more than four a year, but it may be a 14 day window. I don't have an answer. I just make some ideas. Sure. The, other, the other thing is um, on the policy, um, if, if there's four seven day times that, that a boat could use it, is that is some of that time used up by an invitation by the city for a special festival or event like the upbringing, is that using up some of those boats time that they would otherwise make a normal visit, let's call it. Um, when the city has a festival, which now there's been like two this spring, does that count into one of the nonprofits or the boats times? That's, that's a very that's a, good question. That's a very good question. not an answer. I'm just saying maybe if it's no, that's a, a, that's a very good question. And that question was also asked by the pride 
But um, based on my training knowledge and experience, I would say, uh, yes, that is a consideration. However, um, given how many people want to compete for that space, I would say we should not consider that. Yeah. But if you want to come for this, you want to come for this festival, but you want to charge $55 per sailor. So no, you only get still four visits. I don't know how the group feels, but that's how I feel. Yeah. I, I agree. With I don't, you. I don't I have an answer, but just an idea that, that if the city itself invites one or three of these ships in, that it doesn't use up the ship's personal allocation of four seven day visits during the year. That's just a thought. I, I don't I don't agree with you. I've heard this argument, mm -hmm. but I think that four weeks per calendar year, given that in Maryland, we only have May, June, July, August, September, like literally five months. I think it's fair that a, an, um, a ship could have an entire month. I think that's enough. That's my view. I, 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 I agree with Beth. And I also think that um, if the city is inviting them in for a festival, the city's promoting their being here. So they get even more benefit from that particular invitation and that time here than they would if they came on their own. So I do think it's fair for that to count. Just an idea. Maybe a moot point because four seven day visits may be plenty for any boat during the year. Mr. Tomasini. Yeah, I've been I've been listening. It's a, it's a good di discussion. I um I, I feel I agree mostly with Beth. I, I think that the policy is is really well written with a couple of minor edits that we've already mentioned. I think it is fair. I think there are going to be a lot of competing uses for that dock, and it's our first summer doing it. But the rules can always get looser down the road, but it's going to be a, a, a lot harder to tighten it up. So my recommendation is let's give Beth some, you know, some hard and fast rules that everybody's got to adhere to. I would like to see the the you know if if it's seven days a month i would like to see consecutive dates not be included in that seven days consecutive and that's it i don't know what the what the right language is for that um but i i, I don't think that we allow any administrative you know wiggle room for 14 consecutive days it's 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 going to be a really popular asset and we're going to know a lot more at the end of this summer than we than we are going into it and i think just let's keep it clean figure out the rules, everybody plays by them. And then, you know, if we have to tweak it at the end of the summer, then we can do that. But that's my recommendation. Another question. Would it be worth talking to um, one or two of these ships on this kind of policy to get their input just as a, another input into the system? Um, I mean, some of us know ships and these kind of things really well, but from a captain's perspective, the way Beth said they're, they're positive about it, but this is maybe a different aspect of it. And the other thing is that, that whether we like it or not, Annapolis is in competition for these ships in some ports or whatever it may be, Charleston or wherever it is, um, are paying these ships to show up at their ports to show off this kind of maritime heritage. So we have to be careful on what we wish for. If we make it too strict, then the ships are gonna take other venues and go to them more often. Um, I don't they, think that they, I don't they really get paid. I'm just I'm not saying I don't think I don't think that we have some um, data that's convincing to say that someone's paying them to come. And based on my conversations with the captains and the CEOs of these companies, they are very, very happy to come and they don't mind paying electrical costs and they don't mind abiding by our rules. So unless someone can show me some data that shows that someone's paying them to come. I, I'm not saying I don't believe them, but I'm not saying I do believe them. It's, it's hearsay on the street, but it might be worth for the city no. to do. So it's hearsay. It. So I, I don't really believe it. So right. and we, don't, we don't have to believe it, but it might be worth checking with some of these captains or the popular ones that are going up and down the coast. That's my only point. But I have done some checking and I haven't found it to be true. All right. So let's, let's, let's back up. It seems to me that we have a consensus without much discussion at all on the basic concept of if if the vessel is charging for admission or any any charge or is making any charge at all uh, to for the to, to visit the vessel or to go out on the vessel or selling t-shirts, they they are subject to regular dockage fees. I think like that's item number one. So 
let me let me do this. Let me let me parse this up. Is there a motion to recommend that dockage fees be paid if the vessel is charging for sales of? of I mean, I'm just going to use shirts for example, and I'll I'll word the language when I uh, give it to Beth. Uh, shirts, onboard visits, uh, uh, underway visits, or any other activity associated with the ship. If they are charging, then they pay dockage fees. Um, um, is that a mo Is that a yet? Is that a motion? So that is a motion. Moved. Andy has seconded. All in favor of that recommendation. Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, Scott, aye or nay? Uh, aye. Okay. Uh, Kimberly, you got that? She did. Um, secondly, the second concept is on, and, and I, what I'll do is if we approve the motion for the concept, I'll circulate the exact language and we can uh, to give to Beth, but that the that the, the current policy of no more than seven consecutive days and no more than in, in th no more than seven consecutive days per month and no more than three months, uh, I'm sorry, is it, no, no more than four months um, is um, we're fine with that, but, but that the, the seven consecutive days should not run consecutive from one month to the next. So, uh, so I, I, I guess I hear where your head's at, but I'm wondering if we shouldn't say seven consecutive days with a one week break, because I'm not sure with the four month runs, but I, I think that Mike has an idea. So, so the, was there a motion that the seven consecutive days per month uh, be modified to provide that uh, with not less than a one, not less than seven calendar day break in between um, those consecutive days. Okay. Um, anybody have a suggestion on how else to word it? Duncan. Hey, I'd like to take a swing at this. Um, listening to Andy's suggestion, Alan's suggestion, and Scott's. It seems to me, and Beth, you can answer this probably best. We're not, we want these people here if there is space available for them. They, we just don't want them here more than a month total because that's four weeks you know, in a year. So you could say, it seems to me something like, you know, something like they're allowed to stay two, seven consecutive days if dock space is available. That would give us boats at the docks when there was nobody else there, which answers one of the questions. I mean, unfortunately they get precedent for January 1st till April 1st. So that doesn't really work because they could do it every time. I mean, in reality, they have not done that. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how we could word that. I I have never seen in my five and a half years, I have never seen a really productive visit for more than seven or ten days. I, so I, for, I agree with you on that. So for someone to come for two weeks, to me is just we're just like our crews like eating, showering. Like that's fine. But if you're here for seven days, you can eat and shower and like you can do your repairs. You don't need to be here for two full weeks because you're not servicing any group. You're not, no, no one's being served by that in my experience. Well, Beth, let me ask you this. I mean, the, your concern was um, the busy times. So let's, let's, just be, let's just be specific this year. Um, you're already booked for Blue Angels. I assume, are you booked for um, Memorial Day weekend? Yes, booked and booked. And are you booked for 4th of July weekend? Yes, booked. Are you booked for Labor Day weekend? No. So, so in terms of the, I'll call it the, um, the high priority weekends or that where you might get some kind of overlap, it's really not an issue at this point, is it? What's not an issue? That, that, any, that 
anybody's going to stay more than seven consecutive days over the, those most popular weekends because you've already got it booked out. Um, so, so I guess, I guess I understand what you're asking me. So yes, at the moment, if but someone wanted to stay like, like July 11th to July 30th, I suppose that would be fine. So, so but my point is, is that we were, we started the conversation with the concept that um, your, the concern was not having a vessel stay from the end of the th last week of June through the first week of July, basically over the 4th of July weekend uh, and the weekend before. But it set, sounds like as a practical matter this year, at least, that's already sort of taken care of itself because you've already got it booked however you got it booked. And so the only thing that's left maybe would be Labor Day, but maybe we don't need to make a change because as a practical matter, um, it's not an issue. And maybe we wait and see how it works out and tweak that aspect of it. You know, so I, I don't disagree with you. I definitely think that this year is a trial year. I don't disagree with you. I think we're going to like try it out and see, oh, wow, this was a problem or this was not a problem. So that's fine. If the group wants to recommend something that we think is going to work based on the data that we have right now, it's fine. Um, but I think the data, so voting is booming and we're booking up weekends that we never booked up and we're booking up moorings that we never booked up. So I think that this data might change even in six months. So I'm okay with giving a decision based on what we know right now, but I would like the group to realize that this could change. And you had your hand up. Question please. Oh, is there a conflict in your mind, Beth, between people staying for free when they're not soliciting services or selling anything versus when they are paying. When they are paying, they they basically weigh the same amount as recreational vessels, if if I'm not mistaken. But when they're not paying, is that coming out of your pocket in effect? Would you rather not have boats there that aren't, I mean, I think you, you alluded to it, that you'd rather not have boats there that aren't doing anything but boat maintenance even though they look cool, because they're inhibiting you renting the space to recreational yachts. I mean, it's definitely coming out of the city's pocket, but right. more importantly, it's coming out of our um, it's coming out of our other commercial boats pockets. So, like the people like Woodwind or uh, Watermark, like it's coming out of their pockets as well. But so, it is also uh, coming out of the city's pocket because. We just had a booking at City Dock for $5,600 for Summer Wind, and she has never paid. And she was there for nine months last year and paid nothing. Now, I'm not sure that's because uh, there was uh, an Apple's Waterfront and Sailing Center governing that, but clearly she has the money um, because she's been given the price tag and she chose to book it. And so if we look at what the um, money-making potential is on that dock, it's, it's not 40,000, it's probably $100,000. And the city does need money. So uh, the revenue-making potential on that dock is, is, is significant, but also we don't wanna compete with our friends um, that have charter boats in the area, like uh, Watermark or um, excuse me, woodwind. So that all needs to be taken into consideration in my view. So Mike, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't necessarily see it about money. The, the way I look at it is this is the first dock to be managed by the city that is not encumbered by a grant, which means that we have the flexibility to use it in any way that we want without having to give the federal government back a million dollars. So there is going to be, a, the harbor master is going to want to use it effectively. Commercial boats, are, I know, are going to want to use that dock, is my guess, especially, you know, fishing boats that, that don't get to leave out of Annapolis or don't feel it's necessary to do it, have a slip here 12 months a year to do three or four charters from the dock. So I think that the vibrancy of uses down there is, is part of the goal of this policy. And the, the problem with 
you know, we've already prioritized the, the nonprofits and the tall ships by giving them a window to book the dates that they want well in advance, right? So they're already getting the first perk. We don't then also need to apply a, a whole bunch of other flexibilities on them when there is going to be demand for this doc space, I'm sure of it. And, you know, the seven days, I think that's fair. 28 days a year, if you only use it four days, I mean, that, that to me is you use it four days, you can use it more often, but seven days is more than enough for the first year and let's see how it goes. I agree. Oh, is, there a, is there a motion to defer the issue of the consecutive days uh, any change to the vote, any change to the current policy of seven consecutive days in a one month period, just simply defer that until at the end of the year and we have more data. Yeah, I think that's probably not a bad idea. The policy, as Beth told us, I think is going to work through the summer. And if they overlap two weeks, they overlap two weeks. But it's from a practical point of view, being familiar with these bigger boats they've got other fish to fry as well. So and I'm not sure it's really the issue that we're expecting it might be. So I kind of suggest we stick with what we have. Was that a, was that a, a motion? <laughs> okay, there's, there's a motion to defer until we have data at the end of the year. All right, second. Second. I'm gonna say somebody has all in favor, aye. 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 So what we have is, uh, and I'll write it up, is a recommendation <clears throat> on the dockage fees and a recommendation to defer the uh, length of stays um, to the end of the season and we have more data. All right, thank you all. Um, Beth, how about street in parks? My favorite topic. Oh, gee. Um, so it's hard for me to remember all of this, um, but we are moving forward with Cheston. We are moving forward with the 6th Street. Um, we are applying for three more grants between now and September for more money to come between now and July 2023. And we've been given direction from our Department of Public Works. Um, so... So the governing factor is that we only have like so many engineers. So I can apply for seven pots of 250,000, but I'm only going to apply for $250,000 times three because I only have like so many engineers. So if you bear with me, I will pull up my email and see what my directive was. Um, so we are not applying for money for Third Street, which I think is the big question. That's not a priority. So why, why wouldn't we, if we have grant money available and we know we have street ends that are in need of work, why would we not uh, engage a contract engineer for one or more of these, or particularly the smaller ones, that are it's somewhat of a mundane engineering problem. Third Street, I can see, would be a much more challenging engineering issue. But some of these are just rehabs of bulkheads, floating docks, and I would not. No, I've never, I've never heard that a contract engineer was a choice. Well, I've never heard that. I'm making that a suggestion. I mean, we can the city contracts out for services all the time, and you know, for consultants for. Uh, you know, you know, sector studies, you name it, they contract for it. Well, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I've never heard that suggested and I did not know that was an option. Uh, what I would say is I had a conference call with Michael Johnson, who's not with us anymore. And unemployed by the city. I think he's with us. He's not employed by the, by the city. <laughs> his direction was, please don't ask for more than three pots of money for three jobs. <coughs> because uh, I only have so many engineers and the money's only good for three years. So we can only do what we can do, which has merit. I think it is fine. 
Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to answer it now, but can you get back to me or back to the board or you can get back to me and I'll get back to the board uh, about the, uh, about an option to contract for, um, you know, just use a contract engineer on some of these, you know. Yeah, I definitely can. Contract. I've never heard that suggestion. So I never even, so I never even thought that was a choice. So I definitely can do that. And, and you can blame me for bringing it up and asking the question. I am. Um, I'm definitely <laughs> going to blame you. <laughs> are, are, are the three grants for Cheston and 6th Street, are that inclusive or are they something else? Um, I'm looking for the email now and I apologize. So they're definitely um, 6th Street and Thompson, or which Thompson. is kind of a liability. And it might be Amos Garrett because I think that Cheston is already funded. Is so my... So my hunch without finding the email is that it's like uh, more money for 6th Street and also Thompson and also, what did I say? Amos Garrett or... Yeah. So 3rd Street, sadly enough, uh, is not on the radar because there are not enough engineers to manage that. And I never heard that we could contract engineers, but Carrie's suggestion maybe is great. Is that Third Street in Spot Creek? Yes. Yeah. I was I was there today just on business, and I walked from the street up to the pier, um, Mike's pier, the pirate pier, um, which the boat dealer uses the outside of. And there's some safety issues there. And I could not walk from the sidewalk, which is now underwater, but was dry today. It's low, and could not walk from the sidewalk up onto along the, the bulkhead and there are tie rods sticking out with threaded studs sticking out. And so I just walked over to the entrance to the parking lot and then walked I mean, out. To be honest, I spoke to Michael Malinoff today and he thought that there are issues with Third Street that are insurmountable, that there will not be a project there. But anyway, the city, has to be careful that somebody's going to injure themselves and sue the city. So, so just put on the radar screen of somebody. I mean, we cut those bolts off recently, so I'm not sure what you're speaking about, but we'll certainly be happy to visit that again. I didn't feel safe walking straight along the bulkhead up onto the, the land next door, which has the pier. So I just walked up and went up the car entrance and then back out again. But it, well, it, can you yeah. clarify? You didn't feel safe doing what? Walking on the sidewalk on the street which is behind the bulkhead, then up onto the land where the- So walking on a sidewalk to a street, you didn't feel safe about the street end? Walking from the sidewalk onto the property next door, which is along the bulkhead I, there. I think the simple thing is, is that's good. You know, Beth, if you just have somebody go down and take a look at it. it, it well, we just did, and we just cut some bolts off. So I would be- Pleased if you could take some pictures I, I because some pictures. I didn't see anything that would make anyone feel unsafe mm -hmm. walking on the sidewalk. Terry, if you're around, I'll meet you down there. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why don't you all no. coordinate? Yeah, just, we take some pictures. It just seems like a safety issue. Just, just coordinate a brief visit and take a look. Sure. And yeah, no problem. Take a can of uh, that orange paint, a spray can of that orange paint, and spray it on the on the pavement. Yeah. Perfect. Um, all right, um, Jake, I um, am following up on the issue with the or the, the harbor tour. I sent an email to the mayor's office uh, asking for some available dates in uh, on his calendar, uh, starting with his calendar in um, uh, June. I did not offer any dates. I thought I'd let him come back to us and then we'll we'll talk to you and we'll try to coordinate. Um, typically, it would be the invite would go to the mayor, council, uh, department heads, uh, and allow them each to bring a guest if they wish, and then the board. And we usually, Debbie, you can tell me. I mean, we, we generally have had, you know, in the in the range of 20 people, 20, 25 people. I don't think we've ever had much more than that. It's varied, uh, anything uh, like three to 20. How okay. could possibly be two trips? Um, yeah, I don't know, you know, the council, council is that they, they, sometimes they are enthusiastic and sometimes you don't get anybody, but, uh, I, I figured if the, if I can pin down a date that the mayor's going to be there, you know, he usually draws a crowd. 
<laughs> so was, uh, was there an issue of uh, how many councilmen are uh, attending uh, one particular time and becomes a public you, meeting? If you, have, public if you have more than five, if you have five or more, it's a quorum, and therefore it's a public meeting. Right. So, so we we we're we're we we and that that was where we may break if we get to that point we might break it up. We'll just wait and see. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we've ever I, had. Um, I don't think we've ever had five. Um, I think you're right. Um, so um, anyway, I just wanted to give you more than happy to there. more than happy to wait for the mayor and see what date. I I was just going to throw out there June fifteenth. It's a Wednesday. Uh, and do one at ten and one at 11 or one at 10 and one at noon but uh, we'll see what they say all right they they typically um uh what we do is we either whether we pick up at city dock and drop at city dock or we pick up at annapolis landing and drop at annapolis landing it basically covers it almost invariably covers almost right at two hours uh it's just a narrated uh i or somebody else will just do a brief just a narration as we go down the creek around and up a creek uh, and back again. Um, and that's that's basically what it is. It's just a narrated tour from the water. Um, all right, thank you. The um, next item on the agenda, I think, was the public water access plan. I sent everybody a copy from, the, and actually it was just Alderman Tierney's um, uh, blurb about it. Um, but it's it's following up on in in some part following up on the um, city the, the city doc uh, action committee and and also on the heels of this uh, of the overall public access um, the it looks like it is in conjunction with the National Park Service uh, and with some technical support from DOT. Um, I don't, which leads me to believe that it's this particular access, public water access plan may be focused on city dock, but I haven't gotten any good uh, explanation of what the focus is. So if, it, if anybody has a, uh, any more information than what I see here, um, there is, a, by, by the way, there is an online survey. If you click on one of the links or go to one of the links that she has there, there actually is an online survey that is more citywide. It talks in terms of street ends and uh, much more than the city dock, but I don't know what the um, National Park Service role would be other than their interest in a gateway at city dock as we develop uh, Susan Campbell Park. So does anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, we'll wait and see. Stephen, do you have any, um, have you had any uh, input into that uh, particular project? Uh, I have not. And I, and I realized when I glanced over and asked you that question that for some reason, I think I had, we had, I think because of, we missed item 4B, the economic development update. <laughs> So thank you for being patient. We'll turn to that right now. Oh, there's nothing happening. We can go on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean you mean all the uh, all the parking is coming? All parking requirements for re restaurants have gone away. No problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, but we we have three big uh, initiatives that are in you know, various stages. Uh, the seasonal parklet pro program, uh, which is a continuation in a sense uh, and in a different uh, iteration of the recovery zones. Um, we also have the pilot parking lot dining program, which we are uh, looking to launch any day now uh, this is a program that was authorized by R2222, and um, it's going to do a couple of things. It will, uh, well, one, it has continued the uh, recovery zones in a sense in the city, um, authorized their continuance. It has also uh, authorized the pilot program, which will look at uh, outside dining and private parking lots at restaurants and study them 
for uh, one, their impact on parking in the city, two, the, their impact on the city from a, a fiscal standpoint, and three, um, the impact on the restaurants themselves and their revenue. So we're working out some of the uh, logistics, the final logistics before launching that program. And then the, the third uh, program that we have that we will be kicking off uh, some point soon, probably in June, is the Pilot Economic Gardening Program. And this is a program that uh, is designed to support stage two companies with research. And the concept behind the program is that uh, local companies that are stage two that are growing, you know, fairly rapidly, um, if we can get them to continue to grow and support them, then they will hire and spend locally because they're already here. And that's more uh, beneficial. There's some economic thought behind it. That's more beneficial and it has a higher likelihood of success than uh, chasing, you know, um, uh, companies that are located elsewhere and convincing them to relocate to the city. So uh, our plan is to administer the pilot program and focus on maritime uh, businesses. And, you know, stage two, some of the, the components or uh, uh, statistics, these are companies that typically have between 10 and 100 employees, and they have between one and 50 million in annual sales. So uh, it's pretty neat and it's pretty exciting. Uh, Alderman Schandelmeyer has um, shepherded this through the, the city council. Uh, the uh, contract with the group that is gonna be helping us with this is uh, in process. And we're you know, looking to kick this off again in June. So seasonal parklet program, of course, I've talked about that before. Uh, I can answer any questions, but I think you all are probably pretty familiar with what's been happening on that end. All right, thank you. Are there, are there any questions uh, for Stephen? I know um, Forward celebrated their two year anniversary. It's, it's amazing you could start at the beginning of COVID and be celebrating your second year as you come out of COVID. But uh, uh, there's that's, um, that, that's just one that comes to mind because I think they had a uh, they had something they were had some little celebration this weekend. Um, all right, um, Stephen, while I have you, I guess you're the right person to ask. Um, is there um, any um, any update or status as to the uh, Maritime Task Force annual reports? That's not there. Uh, I will look into that. Um, I, I, I don't have an update, but uh, I will check with uh, Eileen Fogarty and my colleagues within the city. Okay. Circle back. All right. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, and this kind of comes around to Beth. Uh, Beth, there was a, uh, and I think Debbie was the one I think that sent it to me. There was a uh, presentation apparently by St. Mary's about a living shoreline project in St. Mary's Cove. And frankly, it was the first I had, and maybe I'd heard of it, but it was the first I'd seen any kind of detail about it. And the question is, um, it appears that the living shoreline, the way they have it designed, may result in reducing the depth at, uh, around some of the city moorings. You have any input, any thoughts on it or input as to what's going on with that? I, I do. I, what I would say is St. Mary's is not on the same page about this project and they are super frustrating. Um, so when they originally proposed this, the city obviously um, supported it because living shorelines are ecologically sound. And so we wanted to make sure that that could happen. Um, but we did tell them you had to move six moorings and that would be at your expense because they're grant encumbered. And they said, well, we are not paying for that. You're paying for that. 
And so the city said, no, no, you're paying for that. Uh, so then they came back to us like probably like only like 10 days or two weeks ago and said, so we don't want to pay for the removal of the moorings or a replacement. So, so backtracking, we said, um, we understand that this is surprising to you and we understand that this is difficult for you. So given the fact that the city has already considered moving these moorings or not moving them, but adding more moorings, here's the work that we already did to add these moorings um, into the area of Upper Spa Creek between Amos Garrett and moving like sort of up creek, like towards the mouth of the creek. So here's the work I did. And I did, I gave them all of my work and said, uh, this is where you can move the six moorings. And um, uh, they, they, that sort of quelled their concerns and they said, okay, we would like to do that. That would be great. And then they came back to us like maybe like two or four or five weeks. Time's escaping me now. And they said like, oh, we're, we're not gonna do that. We want the city to do that. And the city said, no, no, we're not gonna do that. And then they came back to us again and said, um, why don't we do a hybrid? Why don't we do a hybrid of our um, living shoreline where we can do, um, so I guess, I suppose, I don't know too much about living shorelines, but we could bump out and do something different. And I said, well, we'll certainly be happy to listen to that. So, so essentially this model, and I'm sure you saw it in the presentation if you looked at it, would look like we were gonna come out, for example, we were gonna come out like 60 feet, but now we're only gonna come out 20 feet. So we're gonna essentially build a new bulkhead and do a hybrid living shoreline. And so we looked at that and we said, well, that seems fine. And maybe the morning could stay maybe you would save yourselves that money. However, did DNR say yes? And they said, well, no, we didn't ask them. <laughs> so what we said to them is, well, why don't you ask DNR? And if they say yes, then we'll entertain it. But until such time, like it's a huge grant. So until such time that you get the green light from DNR, then why would I look at that? So the last thing I said to them was, go back to Claudia, I don't remember Claudia's last name, with DNR and see if they like this hybrid living shoreline because I don't know how ecological it is. And if Claudia loves it, then the city will consider it. So that's where we are. Maybe my concept of cost is way off base, but putting in five or six moorings would seem to me to be far less expensive than building a new bulkhead. Yes, I agree. I mean, I, I don't think the left hand knows what the right hand is doing in this project. And given the meetings I've had with their crew, uh, I'm confused. Okay. Um, I'm happy to help them. I'm sure the city wants them to do something ecologically amazing. But I don't think that we're, I don't think we're like figuring it all out. It seems kind of like a no brainer. <laughs> Claudia, Claudia Donegan is her last name. At least it was her last name. Oh, and she's quite approachable. Yeah, and yeah, I think she's great. I just don't think that St. Mary's has figured it all out. Oh yeah. All and right. we're happy to help them, but they can't just remove six of our moorings because our grant won't allow it. But also we shouldn't remove moorings because it's it's kind of a narrow waterway. Well, in effect you are if you're if you're letting if you if the offer is to move six moorings to the upper creek, but you were going to add those six moorings in addition to the ones off St. Mary's. So you in effect are losing six moorings. It's just that you're not using losing. You're, you're relocating your grant encumbered moorings in lieu of putting in six new moorings. So you are losing six moorings. No, I agree with you. I couldn't agree more. A question, Terry, that I have uh, legally. 
if somebody has a, a shoreline, whether it's bulkheads or whether it's sand or whatever, um, who says that a landowner can change their shoreline? Is it the city or is it the DNR? It, it could be it could be everybody. It could be the it could be the Corps of Engineers. It could be the city with the port wardens. It could be DNR. BMD. Because they, there is a shoreline there that may have been may have been where the bulkhead is, may have been where the sand, dirt, rocks met the water. Now they're talking about extending their shoreline out. 20 to 60 feet gaining property um well this is mary's this this would be this is not grassy area that you walk on and you're not this is this is a a shoreline that is um i I don't it's it's not they're not increasing their land uh so to speak or at least usable land but but the the issue is um to answer your question the regulatory side of this is probably multifaceted given yeah. their navigable waters. Because if a landowner at the foot of Southgate asked for the same thing, how would they be treated? The same, I think the same. Yeah, yeah. you go through this, whatever the procedures are. But, but, here, but, most, it, yeah. but most, most properties uh, that are waterfront in up Spa Creek, for example, have a dock and they don't want to give up their dock. <laughs> well, the c- city has moorings same thing so yeah. it's the city's yeah. got a vested interest in it for the more we don't it's not that on. we don't want to except that we can't because they're granting homework yeah so we have to provide those moorings it was all part of the grant and, and so it's, it's kind of have to be careful what you wish for because this could set a precedent for everybody on spot creek to do something i seriously doubt that people are going to give up their waterfront okay well they may they may want to do the same thing and move their dock out just like the moorings and that, that's a problem because then it's got to go to the port wardens and it's got to go yeah. to the core it's got to i mean they're sure so and i'm not but i would also mention to the group that dnr has said if you want to pay off your grant encumbrance then you will not get any more grants because you have demonstrated that you have no need for grants so if you want to say like i'll pay off all these uh, moorings because i don't want this encumbrance or this land use agreement then guess what no more grants for you. Oh man. So we need to remember that it's, this is not a joke. They they will hold that and they will remember that and they will say no more grants for you. First time I've heard that, but um, certainly- uh, They said it in writing, so it's true. Gotcha. Well, you say things in writing on the internet and it's not always true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any, Thank you for sharing uh, that, Beth. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, and is, is anybody else got any comments, questions? Or? I do. Okay. I have one more. So we talked about the Berta stock, but we didn't talk about um, some of the difficulties with the Berta stock. So um, folks always want to see that the STEM programs move forward. And STEM is unique because it's in end users' boats that are doing STEM. And uh, so no one has turned in any forms for them. And we don't wanna see STEM go by the wayside. Um, So we might need to consider that when we talk about the Burtis Agreement. So my thought is, so, so if I'm a person that owns a sailboat and I want to participate in STEM, I want to contribute to that group, then maybe, um, I don't want to, I don't want to like, um, um, what's the word? I don't want to um, confirm my confirmation. I don't want to confirm my booking like three months out because maybe I'm not sure I want to do it. So I think during the Burtis talk, um, um, the, the, um, Oh, geez. When we're looking at how we want to run the Berta stock, maybe we should consider STEM separately. So maybe, so I don't know, I don't know who the people are that have signed up for STEM. So maybe someone, maybe it's Lee, Tawny, maybe it's you, Scott. I don't know who it is, but maybe they um, 
book this two weeks out and then maybe um, uh, as long as they contribute to the cancellation policy. So as long as they say like, if, if no one signs up for it, like at least three days out, we cancel it then that's fine. Um, then we can book it. Cause what I don't want to see happen is for STEM to go by the wayside. Beth, are you okay. saying to make an exception to the pay to play rule if no, they are they... offering a STEM program? So, so they wouldn't have to, I guess they wouldn't have to pay. I'm not sure that they're not a 501c3. Five, yeah, STEMs, I, think, sure. I believe the STEM is run by the public school system and the waterfront center helps to organize the dates and organize the volunteer boats to do not get paid for their services. They're purely volunteer. And yeah, I'm I, not sure how we would run it, but I just think we need to consider them because I think it's important. Yeah, and I think, well, I think people, Lee can do that. You know. Beth, Beth, wouldn't, wouldn't, so let's, I mean, wouldn't the simple thing be that if there is a, that a booking for STEM, and as I understand the way STEM works is it's, as Scott said, it is a, it's a public school program that is run with volunteer teachers and volunteer boats, uh, at least the, the, the maritime aspect of it. And what they need is to be able to come into the dock and uh, whatever the whatever boat is going to come in, uh, and so wouldn't that simply fall under? And they're they're not for, they're 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 not they're not a nonprofit, but they're it's a not for profit sure. uh, education endeavor. And so wouldn't they just simply the responsible person, whether it's the captain? and Lee can help the captain submit the application or whatever, wouldn't they just book like any other not-for-profit? Yes, yes, they would, sure. But I'm not getting any bookings from Lee, and I'm sure that that doc will book up, and I don't want that to happen. So I'm that, sure that's that important, be, yeah, but that no one priority. is booking it. No one's booking it, and no one's being responsible for it. And everyone, so according to our current policy, which I think is fair yeah. and legitimate, no one's booking it. And so this is going to go by the wayside and these are going to be booked up by recreational boats. And I don't want to see that happen. That this is important to everyone. Beth, I don't think it's going to go by the wayside. And right now it's all free. So if he's not booking it for STEM programs, even when it's free, then the issue is not um, about the policy at the dock. The issue is their, whatever they're doing or not doing to book it. Um, the Annapolis Maritime Museum is certainly booking STEM programs, and I know, I, I believe, I'd have to defer to Jake, but um, Watermark has done plenty of STEM programs and oyster programs in conjunction with the Annapolis Maritime Museum. When you say it's all free, Debbie, what do you mean? What's all free? Up until this conversation today, it's my understanding that the nonprofits could, the current policy for the long dock is that nonprofits are free, period, Correct. But they have to book because I'm going to, I'm not booking them and right. they will not have any bookings. Okay. So if I can speak up just for a minute. Don't sure. really interrupt. The reason these haven't been booked yet is because of the clarity on the long dock policy. I can tell you that, that Lee and Waterfront Center has these bookings, so to speak, in their pocket waiting for the clarity. So if this is a go now with this policy. The clarity, sure the clarity is there. Lee has Good. chosen That's not great. to book. The and clarity is there. Oh, let's 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 just back up a minute. Scott, maybe the simple thing to do instead of arguing about it here is if Lee has dates ready to be booked, and ask him to book them tomorrow morning. And yeah, it'll solve it's it. Simple. Yep, ex exactly. It's, and it's, if, the STEM, if the county schools don't have a STEM program, that answers it. Yeah. They have a STEM I program. I don't want to see it get wrecked. I want to see it go forward. Right. Everybody does. But but I can't have no bookings and just imagine that it's going to be booked. All right. Yeah. It, it, we've solved it. Yep. Scott's Simple. Gonna, Scott's going to go back to AWSC, say, get your bookings in. So this pro program, because the dock is quickly filling up. It's, use, it's just, use it or lose it. Yep. It's real simple. It's, this is not, sure. this is not something that we should be wasting a lot of time about. Absolutely. Sure. Um, just one quick thing. Sure. Right, have we finished that topic? We have. All right. Or or I have. I don't know if anybody else has. <laughs> All right. 
Um, do we have any feedback on upbringing? Because from my point of view, it went great. And I think the Harbor Master and the people who managed it should be complimented on it. Uh, thousands of people went across the decks of all of our boats. And it was a really positive thing, in my opinion. That makes me really happy. I'm so pleased. I came in. It was interesting. It was it was nice to see the boats in the harbor. I came into the harbor on Friday on my boat and uh, to see the see the boats. And, you know, there obviously was it generated excitement and uh, that was all good. And the weather had generally cooperated. <laughs> kind it generally, of. It generally did. And uh, kind of. <laughs> I was surprised with the iffiness of the weather. I was surprised at how many people were actually down there. So I think it's a good decision. And um, I personally like to see it happen again. We have a we have a plan in place. Yes, Andy. I totally agree. I came down there as a tourist and did my tourist thing and had a great time. Uh, OK, I'm going to bring up something negative, sorry. But um, the land space and the parking that was taken away was not used well. And it seems like the festival did not need to use up as much of the land space as they had booked and, and blocked off. Um, the boats part of it is great. But on the land side, I don't know who the vendors were and if they were maritime or not, or had anything to do with maritime. But there was a lot of blocking off of space that could have been used by by customers for them and for everybody else downtown. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, absolutely, Debbie. I agree with you. The, um, interestingly enough, speaking of parking, et cetera, they kicked off, <clears throat> there was an article in yesterday's paper, maybe it was this morning's, uh, they kicked off the um, Eastport, at Eastport Shopping Center. They had a bunch of e-bikes and uh, people riding around the parking lot and talking about the transportation into downtown from Eastport and elsewhere during the, um, so we'll see how, it, I, I downloaded the Annapolis, what was it, Stephen, it's Annapolis Go, the app, there's an app, um, it's worth taking a look at. You can actually book um, a ride, uh, almost like an Uber, it looks like. You jump on a Segway, Terry? I did not get on a Segway. I have been on an electric. I have ridden an electric bike. Yeah, Annapolis Go, G O. It's an app that uh, you can download. Oops. And uh, it's it's a rider. It's you know there's a survey, but it's also a an app on you know where would you where would you where would you like to go? You you know book your ride, whatever. So we'll see how it works. Might be interesting. You're on mute, Frida, but yeah, I, I booked it. I'm, I'll try it at some point. Yep, I've got it too. All right, is there a motion with respect to adjourning? Ah, uh, Debbie, Andy second, all in favor? Aye. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, good job. Thanks everyone.